our recording now because we are starting the recording. Um, so just to let you guys know, this is actually a photograph of our reading room. And this is where if you were to come in to do research, this is where you would sit. So we have a lot of our um, records that are bound and most light are most widely used in this space as well as some exhibit space. So if you came in, this is where you would sit. Now our records date, date back to 1803, which was when Ohio gained statehood, but it was also when Greene County was established. So it, it actually makes Greene County one of the first and also one of the oldest. Now today this program is really about the historical account of the long lasting effects of the 1913 flood and how it altered the landscape of Greene County. So we wanted to start with the flood. On March 21st, 1913, which also happened to be Good Friday, there was somewhat of a normal spring day. The temperature was around 60 degrees, but the winds started to gust and the winds gusted up to 60 miles per hour. And also the temperatures dropped rather dramatic, drastically and they went down to about freezing temperatures. And then by Sunday, it started to rain. And Dayton received between eight and 11 inches of rainfall in four days, the equivalent, the equivalent of three months worth of rainfall. And then on top of that, the region had actually experienced a rather harsh winter. And so the ground was already saturated with ice and snow melt. So this coupled with the rain actually created dangerous conditions. And 90% of the rain that fell actually became runoff. So then by Tuesday, March 25th, the levees along the Great Miami River failed, and it caused some of the worst flooding in Dayton's history. And about 20 feet of water flooded downtown Dayton. And this is actually a photograph of downtown Dayton at the northeast corner of 5th and Ludlow, and it depicts some of the early stages of flooding. So you can actually see, if you look over to the right um, in the photograph, there's actually a man in the water. He's walking about wasted deep. So we're guessing there's probably about three to four feet of water, probably closer to three. You can also see a couple people around that pole. This is another photograph of downtown Dayton, and it's at the corner of 4th and Ludlow during the flood. And if you look closely, you'll notice there are horses swimming in the flood waters. And it's important to note that horses were still your main mode of transportation at this time, as cars were still rather expensive. So a, trad, a sad truth of the flooding is that roughly 1,400 horses perished in the flood and another 2,000 domestic animals. And there are some early images that actually depict some of this early carnage, and it's, they're difficult to view, but it's just important to note that there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of death and destruction that happened. This image is also important as it shows the sheer force and power of the water. So if you look over to the left corner, um, you'll see there is a lamp post, and in the left there is a whirlpool. So that just shows you how quickly this water is moving. And obviously the water is fairly high, so we're guessing we estimate it's probably between four and five feet deep at this point. Now this image is of 2nd Street between Main and Ludlow, and it's a clear indication of the depth of the water. The first floor of the inn and the businesses are completely flooded in, with only the tops of the first floors of it, um, visible, meaning that they were probably witnessing close to 10 to 12 feet worth of water. And although the water looks rather smooth, if you look to the lamp post that's closest to the end, you can see the current flowing from there. So this water is still moving rather quickly, and it's very cold. Remember I told you the temperatures dropped rather drastically. And so these people are already stuck in these buildings, which just kind of indicates how quickly this flooding started. And so you can actually see people in these buildings. If you look in the windows of the inn on the first floor and up on the second floor, or I guess technically be the second floor and the third floor, and then the building next to it, you can see people in those windows too. So they were, they were stuck and the only thing they could do was continue to cut go to higher ground and just wait to be rescued. Now this is actually an, an artistic rendering of the Dayton flood. And to note, like I said, the floodwaters did crest about 20 feet in Dayton in low lying areas. And this actually depicts the main thoroughfare, so Main Street in Dayton. And it, 
the artists wanted just to show the sheer chaos of downtown with the rain, the flooding, and the fires. Homes were literally washed away. Fires broke out in downtown Dayton due to damaged gas lines. An entire city block burned because the fire department was unable to get to the, um, this block due to the floodwaters. However, there were businesses and businessmen and people within the region who were really vital in that recovery effort and started right away with the rescue parties. And they were sent out throughout the city. National Cash Register, better known as NCR. If you look on the boat, you can actually see NCR spray painted. Um, they were one of the Dayton companies that worked diligently to help Dayton recover. John Patterson, who was the owner, had his 10-story factory converted to build rescue boats. They sent out search parties and rescue parties. He allowed the National Guard to set up tent camps on his property to provide, to provide temporary housing. And they were one of the organizations that provided meals to those who were displaced. Now we wanted to show a map that kind of gives you a good overview of where this flooding actually took place. So this is a map of the city of Dayton and you can see that the flooding radius, how, how large it really was. Um, it's kind of a quite chilling vision here, yet it's a great depiction of the devastation. The floodwaters actually spanned 14 miles and the Great Miami River swelled to over a mile wide on either side of the river. And here are just a few statistics. More than 360 people from the Miami Valley died in the flood. There were roughly 65,000 people displaced. It's estimated that the flood caused over $100 million in property damage in 1913, which is an equivalent of over $2 billion today. So after the flood, there were people within the region, there were about 23,000 people who came together and contributed $2 million to create a comprehensive flood protection packet or program. And Arthur Morgan was actually an engineer who was hired to execute that program. So the Great Flood really ignited the Ohio Legislature to pass the Conservancy Act in 1914, and it allowed for regional agencies to form, to be formed to do what was necessary to make sure this type of disaster didn't happen again. And that was really the beginning of the Miami Conservancy District, which was established in 1915. And then soon after, Morgan worked to create that dam system with levees built downstream. Now the system would actually created five dams along the tributaries of the Great Miami. And the five dams built were the Germantown Dam, Englewood Dam, Huffman Dam, Lockington, and Taylorsville. But the one of consequence was, Huffington, or was the Huffman Dam. So Huffman Dam is actually built on the Mad River near Riverside in what is today Fairborn. Um, and upon completion, the dam um, measured 300, or sorry, 3,340 feet long and 65 feet high, and it can store roughly 55 billion gallons of flood water. And this is actually a photograph of Huffman Dam being uh, during its construction. And this is a photograph after its completion. So you can see it there. I mean, obviously this is before the bike path was built. Uh, the dams were, the whole idea of a dam is to, to control the flow of the water, to control, um, but there was actually a problem with, with Huffman Dam. And it wasn't a small problem, it was actually kind of massive. So I'm going to actually now switch over to Elise, and she's gonna take over. Okay, hello everyone. So let's get to the next slide. Let's see. There we go. So due to the placement of the dam, the Huffman Dam, and the reservoir with the newly established floodplain, if the region were to ever experience another natural event, like the one that led to the 1913 flood, one small village in Bath Township would be destroyed. And that village was Osborne. So you can see here in this map, Osborne was up here, 
and this is the Mad River, and then this is the border here with Montgomery County where the, Huff, uh, the Huffman Dam was built. So this Osborne Village was quite in some peril. So this is a picture of Osborne Village, which had about a roughly 1,000 people residing in its borders. And this is an aerial image of the village. So in this, um, Im in this uh, aerial, you can see the train depot, the railroad line, the businesses, houses. So um, what, were, what were the residents of Osborne to do? I mean, they had all of the, the, the trains, they had the houses, they had the businesses. And they actually came up with rather an unusual so solution. So the Osborne Removal Company, what they did, they decided to pack up and move. So how did they coordinate such an effort with a thousand people that lived in this village? Uh, the Osborne Removal Company was organized and incorporated in March 1920 by several local businessmen, and its sole purpose was to relocate the town of Osborne. They acquired land for a new town about two miles southeast of the original town, adjacent to the village of Fairfield. The ORC Board of Trustees hired the Dayton-based firm of Solarius and Dressler as engineers and designers of the new town and contracted with Geiger and Dill to install gravel streets, curbs, sidewalks, and gutters. Sheeler and Son Company were hired to do the actual moving of the buildings. And telephone and slash telegraph wires, gr gas and electric lines, as well as some railroad lines were moved or established in the new town. So all the although the goal was straightforward, it was not completed, it was not completed without problems. <laughs> There were several lawsuits filed against the Osborne Removal Company by residents, contractors, and employees. Perhaps some of these residents did not want to leave, or perhaps parts of the contract were not completed. Um, but all in all, the company was dissolved in 1928, just eight years after its creation, once the work had been completed. And I just love this image of this huge um, man pick, literally picking up the town of Osborne and moving it. So here we have a 1896 map of Osborne, which depicts the original town before they moved. And it shows the numbers in red what were assigned to the houses to the Osborne Removal Company prior to the move. So you can read up here, numbers in red are the numbers that were assigned to the Osborne Removal Company. And then you can see the red. And then you can also see uh, the additions that were part of the original town of Osborne. Um, it's kind of interesting. We use this map, um, Melissa does, when she goes to uh, fourth and sixth grade classes, they use this as a map activity just to learn um, how to read a map and how to use a map using the compass and seeing um, specific markers in the town just to give them an idea of what a small town life was like. So here we have, um, we're going to take a look at some of the houses that were moved. And we're looking at a page from the Miami Conservancy District appraisal record. You can see here that their actual name was Zeller, not Zellers. I think the person made a mistake but um, in this volume. But the Zeller family's home and property were valued at $2,875 if you add all of these columns up. And interesting is here is an actual photograph of the Zeller family in the process of moving their home. Uh, moving was completed by putting the house on a trailer, see this very large tank-like trailer, and, and or wagons drawn by horses. And you can see here in the photograph, this is actually Mrs. Zeller on top of the um, tractor. But consequently, the house was jacked up, almost like a car would be jacked up, and they were put on blocks were placed strategically to allow for the weight to be supported and for the trailer to slide under the house. So they did this very carefully. And then let's take a look at another um, house. Here we have um, also listed in the Miami Conservancy District's appraisal record, the Sidenstick family. 
and their property was appraised at two thousand dollars okay now it looks like this 200 but this 200 is actually part of this family the state and family so two thousand um, dollars appraisal value for the side and stick family house and then let's take a look at that photo of the move so here we have them moving their home which I still think is pretty amazing to see <laughs> just a house um, jacked up on on the, uh, like that and, and moved um, you can see the large tractor getting ready to relocate the home and there's actually a very interesting little story that goes with this unusual move. Um, Robin Heiss, our records manager slash archivist, uh, completed an oral history with a former resident of Osborne. And he told her of a little experiment of his, where at the time of the move, he was a young boy and was curious about this moving process. So he filled a glass with water and placed it on the kitchen counter. And when they moved, when the house was moved, the boy left the house, you know, got out, and when they moved, it took about three hours for the house to move from Old Town of Osborne to its new location. And when the boy finally was able to go back into the house, he ran inside, and what happened? What did he see? Did the glass fall? Was it still full? Lo and behold, it stayed exactly in the exact same place, and not a drop of water spilled. So I think this just illustrates just how much care was taken to move these homes. Um, if it took three hours to move around two miles, that's an extremely slow pace. So you could have walked to the new location quicker than the tractor or horse that was pulling it. So they really took their time and they were able to do this in a complete fashion. Okay, so the majority of the houses, about 200 in all, were moved between 1922 and 1924. So here we are looking at a 1920 map of Bath Township and about two years before the Osborne Removal Company started the move. So however, we can see that the two villages weren't that far apart from each other. I mean, here is old, here's old Osborne and just two miles southeast, they would have about right here. So it is very close. Now here we have a 1924 aerial photograph, which is about the time that the, house, the homes of Old Osborne had been relocated. And you can see that New Osborne is platted and there are already homes and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the run. Let me go back to the other slide. Hold on for a second. Let's see if I can do that. There, oh. There we go. I apologize for that. So right here, this is the 1924 aerial map. You can see Osborne, the new location of Osborne, and then the dividing line, which is the dividing road, and then here's Fairfield. And you can already see that the houses have already been relocated here. Okay, now this is a 1948 uh, blueprint and it shows Fairfield and Osborne coexisting next to each other and they have coexisted for many years. So this just showcases the growth of both towns over time. Here's Fairfield in, in 1948 and here's Osborne in 1948. However, it's important to note that both Fairfield and Osborne's growth were stymied be somewhat because of the close proximity of the Air Force Base. So that was also a constriction with having the Air Force Base so close, they weren't able to grow as much as they could have. So after coexisting next to each other for roughly 25 years, both the representatives of Osborne and Fairfield began to discuss plans of merging both towns. Each town had their own police, fire, and municipal government, and furthermore, growth options were limited for both towns, as I mentioned before, because of the constrictions of the Air Force Base and both towns being so close to each other. So therefore, they believed that it would be beneficial for both if they merged. So this merger was voted on in 1949 and was completed in 1950. So to demonstrate the merger, the new city voted to also merge their former names, taking Fair from Fairfield and born from Osborne, creating Fairborn. 
And really, we've looked up the only um, fairborn in the world is the one located right here in Greene County, which is pretty amazing. And this year, 2020, the city of Fairborn is commemorating their 70th anniversary. So congratulations, the city of Fairborn. And then you can see here, we found this kind of neat replica sign of Fairborn. And then this is a 1959 map of Fairborn of the, both the towns combined. And you can see down here, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So we want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we welcome any of your questions. I think Melissa, I'm going to give the screen back to Melissa and see if any of you have questions. Yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature. Um, we figured that one might be a little easier because we don't have the, um, the setup for the raise your hand as a conference setting would be.